Great relationships don't just happen. They're designed. Why leave love to chance when you can make strategic decisions in your relationship just like you do in your career? The days of settling for mediocre are over. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. Join us as we explore the decisions and choices that make relationships work no matter what life throws your way. It's time to reimagine relationships from the ground up. Welcome to Project Relationship. Hi, and welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. We're going to talk about pornography. Pornography. We're going to talk about porn use today. So, right off the bat, I know a bunch of people might be pressing pause, stop. Wait, am I actually ready to listen to this in the environment I'm in? Mm. The answer is, yeah, do check that. We're not going to check our language here. Um as closely as we do in some episodes so yeah be mindful about where you're listening and let's um let's address the elephant in the room the the porn elephant is is there elephant in this porn i don't have any elephant porn i'm not aware of any at all i have none stored on my hard drive even but go ahead ethics yes ethically made porn so there is definitely lots and lots of non-ethically made porn where the people involved are it's not, not it's not clear whether they are consenting clear, or yep. whether there's coercion going on or it's not clear whether they're being paid appropriately whether they enjoy their work so yeah as a sex educator i i had to get really clear on what my perspective was both personally and professionally on porn and one of the things that really cleared things up for me was that there is there is pornography that is made that is made by people who are engaged in their work, who are enjoying their work, who are, well, they're being paid for their work, compensated. They're at choice. They are, they are professionals. They're doing a job that they like. And finding resources for ethically sourced porn means that you will be paying for your pornography. Yeah. So... Let's just make, like, take a deep breath and realize that that's just part of consuming an ethical entertainment product. That's our part of the ethical part of it. Um, There are some other solutions. You know, you could make your own. We've made some Mm -hmm. for each other, right? So there are some other options in there. But, yeah, you're going to wind up paying for it. So we're going to put some links in the show notes to some great options for um, for purchasing or subscribing to some ethical porn sources. And one of the ways it's so important, one of the reasons why it's so important to have access to ethically made pornography is that when you know where, what's going on for the people, what their motivation is, yeah. what these, what these actors, what these part- performers are doing, when you know, it takes a great big other elephant out of the room. Shame. Shame. Right. So a bunch of the shame that a lot of us feel, or at least this is how I experienced it. I loved pornography. Loved it. Loved porn so much. Um, I first came across it when I was pretty young and I liked it. But there was still some shame stuff attached to it. And one of the things was that I, I knew that there was an industry that was not necessarily treating women well. It, that was obvious to me, even as a teenager, that was obvious to me, that there was stuff going on, that this did not look like it was made with care and attention to how everyone felt. So it can be uncomfortable to participate in that, knowing yeah. that you don't know what's going on right. behind the scenes. So the the sources where you can know, where you can rely can... on them, and they have disclosures and things like that. Uh, takes and, takes a load off, right? And, a... You know, having like having the performers face the camera and talk about like their reasons and what right. they felt and what yep. they liked, like that really does take an edge off for many of us. It takes an edge off for me in a great way. It takes not the yummy, delicious edge of fun, but instead the uh, am I participating in something that yes. I am actually opposed to? Because I'm not opposed to sex. I love sex, but. I am opposed to people being abused. I am opposed to people being coerced and mistreated. So, yeah. So that's how one of the big ways that I dealt with my shame around porn. Um, 
What about you? Because <laughs> you had a more, um, you've had a more colorful, checkered past well, with with how you feel about it. Yes, I, um, my yeah. parents didn't introduce any shame around this. So when they found that I had some, it was just no big deal. It was whatever they did too. Yep. It, it just wasn't a big deal. And I lucked out. I didn't even know that it was a big deal because I don't know. It was just imagery and it wasn't made a big deal out of. So I didn't, it didn't gather. Well, we've talked about complexes, some psychological complexes. Porn didn't have a lot of, um, uh, heavy complex energy because mm -hmm. yeah it just it was just a thing it was it was a thing to get off to or to enjoy or to titillate my imagination but whereas i had the very classic i think it's a fairly classical experience of it being forbidden well at least in your generation in my generation so yeah right Gen for the people that i was growing up around that it feels very like it was very common so what was your first was exposure forbidden. to porn um, my first exposure to porn was don't name any names magazines. <laughs> um, that someone, uh, another, uh, another boy had, I don't actually know where he got them probably from his older brother, I would guess, but I don't know. Um, but he would, he would bring it to places where we would go and we would look at it. Various and assorted boy scout camps and what have you. For example, Bible camp, for example, not Bible. I don't remember seeing porn no, at the Bible camp. Plenty of other stuff happened at Bible camp. Plenty of other stuff. That's for real. Um, so, yeah. So my first exposure was was that. And it was I was sort of I mean, I wasn't prepubescent, but it was quite a while before I started masturbating. So I, I was so you saw looking the imagery. at I saw the imagery and I, I felt the some some in, internal stuff going on, but it didn't lead to masturbation right then. That's you know, it's, fascinating. Isn't it? It yeah. is kind of interesting. So my first exposure led very quickly to finding ways to bring myself pleasure. Um, and I'm pretty sure I'd already been self-pleasuring. I'm pretty sure masturbation was already part of my, mm -hmm. my um, mental schema, like what I did. Yeah. Um, and I think it is worth saying. we had saying, different exposures and different lives. And I, I think it is worth saying that, I didn't intentionally masturbate to the porn, but as a, a fairly sensate kind of kid, I'm certain there were things that I did with my body to produce pleasure. Yeah, um, sure. Including with my penis, but I didn't think of it as masturbation. Yeah, there's the thing. We, I mean, first you have to be introduced to there being a word for it, right? Because we don't, we don't have like a special word for have like scratching an itch. Yeah, we don't like we just say scratching an itch. We don't mm -hmm. like, like there's not a special word for scratching an itch between your shoulder blades, even though that feels good. <laughs> That's a thing. Right. Right. Yeah. So we might. I can. In fact, I could invent a word for that because that would hit this. That would hit the spot right now. Yeah. Even. Yep. I'm not even itching. It would still hit the spot. Mm. So when you get the word for masturbation and when you've started actually actively self-pleasuring, yeah, those two things yeah. might not line up so you have to like put them together oh oh that's what's going on right and part of that is because sex education is abysmal in the united states culture oh. but part of it seems to be i think that we all just we mature and come toward pleasure like move into pleasure at different times and different rates and yeah. when we were um talking earlier about this i remember you referring to yourself as a late bloomer and i've i've heard that phrase from lots of people and it's funny similarly to the way we say there's no normal amount of sex mm -hmm. there's no normal right. time when you have to start masturbating after which you are some <laughs> late bloomer like right. you've been left no, on the vine isn't. too long that is not a thing there's also the question of what blooming is in this context oh because... not when you masturbate like i do no question no that. question <laughs> well is that is that what i was talking about did i mean i didn't start masturbating until i imagined everybody else had already started did i mean were you imagining I'm... when anybody else started and it before right so the a whole bunch of you... questions Wait, come up yeah, I don't even know what that means anymore. I remember saying it and I remember like the tone of what I meant. But as I actually asked myself the questions, what does that mean? So my first exposure to porn was magazines and um, 
I would look at them, but it had never occurred to me before I saw them that I can recall to imagine other people naked and having sex. So all of a sudden, boom, there were these pictures in front of me. Yeah. And now I did imagine that. Sure. And so um, that is sort of in, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Was it, now I'm all confused <laughs> about the idea of, of blooming and when things happen. It doesn't matter. No. Uh, so I saw it when I saw it. You saw it It had the, it. the the impact on me that it did, which was imaginative and a little bit of sensory, um, but it didn't inspire me to masturbate for for a while, for probably a couple of years. So I think that knowing this stuff about you, having these conversations and, and having you know this stuff about me, um, it's been part of the process of, of, of being vulnerable with each other. Yeah. Um, sharing the the how we came to be who we are, yeah. sharing the stories and and providing each other with context, it was part of our the deepening of our relationship was sharing these stories. Oh, yes, definitely. And one of the reasons I wanted to go ahead and share it in this format is it's so much less scary. So I I can stand on a stage and talk about this easily now because it. I have, I have detached it from any sort of judgment about what the right time or what the right way for this all to happen would have been. Mm -hmm. And that lets me share it with you, with other lovers, with, um, with myself in new ways as I grow and change. Yeah. And at the center of all of that is any judgment that I had about porn itself Right. I, like any judge, I, it, it wasn't like I was, I was raised in a house where it was normal for there to be porn. It existed. Like I knew there was porn in my parents' room. Um, so there was no shame there, but still as I grew, so I got married. Um, there's still these questions. There was a actually sort of recloseting of porn. Mm. Like, because then once you have a regular partner, there are lots of conversations to have around what is porn use now that you have a partner that you have access to and you think of as like a, a your access to sex. We talked about sexless marriages too. Yeah. Like, so if you have a sexless marriage by design and you chose it, does that include not having, like you also don't access porn or, or is your solo sex life completely separate? How, how we define all this stuff is, well, it's super fascinating. fascinating. Yeah, <laughs> right? it really is. When, when you and I were first discovering what each other liked, one of the things that I wanted to introduce right away was, so what do you like to watch? Which was a stunning question for me because porn had been through my entire life up to that point, something that was hidden. So it was private. It was private. Oh, more private's than private's not the same as okay. hidden. I don't want to put yeah. words in your mouth. Um, it was um, it was taboo. Oh, okay. Right, and that's different from private. Private is okay. This is mine. It's, it's good. It's fine. It's fine. But I, it's not something I want to share with anybody else. It wasn't that. It had that extra energy of I'm not supposed to, but I am, so I hide it. D is that what made it erotic? It's not the only thing that made it erotic, but there was an erotic element to it for so sure. That tells me that that could have been part of the resistance. There was some resistance at the beginning of our relationship when I was like, yeah, I want to see what you watch. I want to like, absolutely. Let's share it. Oh, I have a better answer to that question. Um, was it part of the erotic for it in my imagination? Absolutely. It was a huge part of it. And I thought that if I shared it, it would lose its eroticism. Okay. So it was my imagination. So there's of it. the thing. But then we did we it. We eroticize so. things for lots of reasons. And one of the reasons that we sometimes eroticize, we we give erotic meaning to something, is because then we can take something that doesn't feel comfortable or that isn't working for us and we can assign it this meaningful, pleasureful sensation. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, it's an old concept, but just, and it, and it makes sense if you just think about, you know, if, um, you think about spanking, you, like a, a really mild form of, of impact play, people can feel pain as pleasure 
you can also eroticize something that like secrecy of this thing of, of not yeah. sharing this thing didn't feel inherently good to you but i could imagine you eroticizing it giving it allowing that charge to build mm -hmm. building it into the story so that it doesn't hurt that you also that you have to hide it yeah that you because it sounds like my, the stories that i've heard from you tell me that it seems like you felt like you you had to hide it it wasn't something that was allowed to be um, shared and discussed and normalized. That was my household. understanding of my world. Yes. So it was the unspoken yep. again. So a silent agreement. Unspoken both in my my growing up family and then in my marriage as well. Okay. And I come along and I'm like, so what you doing? And you started <laughs> speaking. Started speaking yeah. at all. Uh, yeah. And your interest in it and your relaxed... Um, approach to it very slowly let me open up um, yeah to the point where now i can talk about it too i don't even know who you guys are out there hello um <laughs> but hi uh, let's talk about elephant porn well, Wait, that's i swear that's not what we're talking about but it, now the elephant now, really now feels it's like it's in the room coming back. what about the use of pornography like what did you think i was doing when i was bringing up what do you watch? Do you want to see what I watch? What do you, what, like, well, what did you think I was doing? <laughs> at first it felt like, um, it felt like curiosity. And part of me felt like it was, uh, an attack. It's not quite the right word, but I felt under threat. Yeah. Because I was well, being asked. that explains some of the behaviors. Yes, right? Right? Yeah. Because I was being asked to expose something that I had been asked not to expose. Very confusing. <laughs> and, and and you were living with both of us. With, with the oh, person yeah. who was, <laughs> right, so that was asking extra you confusing. not to expose. Right. The, yeah. And so that must have been quite the, that's all, quite the mind fuck. There was a lot of cognitive dissonance in those days. And yeah. you didn't have a perspective. As far as that, my experience no. of it was you just had no standpoint around no, it. I didn't. So you I were just, was just picking it up from my like, surroundings. So and... whatever. So you were just adapting your answers to whatever the moment was. I experienced that as, oh, he's he's hiding. He's hiding right. his erotic self from me because here I am. I, I was increasingly sharing my erotic story with you. And your standpoint and your value is about sharing and openness and transparency that's the hottest thing for me and personally. I I was not there. Right. So I remember in early early days it being I also practiced giving this erotic charge. I felt closed out of that part of your life. Like I would I would know like the office door would be locked. Um you had a private office um and the office door would be locked at a particular time and I, I mean I could put two and two together. I'm not an idiot. I knew what was going on. And no one was supposed to know what was going on, by the way. <laughs> yeah. So funny. So <laughs> Most ridiculous. of us don't live with idiots and we yeah. actually do we know. We all know. But so I knew and I, I started eroticizing that for myself because I, I was, I just straight up, I was just bummed. I wanted to be part of that. I wanted to watch it with you. I wanted to participate. I wanted to, whatever. I was game for like whatever, but I felt closed out. I was closed out. So I started building myself an erotic story that would allow that to be pleasurable. So I did. I have now what still exists. It's um, it, it's this, this whole erotic schema, this core story that I keep and I nurture around you hiding things from me, even though what I require of you is transparency. Well, and what is fun about that is that I can be totally transparent and open and honest with you and also play with that because we right. can play with it. It doesn't have to be something I'm doing. So it's yeah. a thing we, it's a toy we can play with. It's not a core part of our relating. So at first I was eroticizing this thing that was happening that I was experiencing as painful. I made a story up around it, gave it meaning, and then started to apply that even to my own porn use, my own masturbation practices. And after a couple of years, I was no longer okay with that. I didn't want yeah. it to proceed the way it had. Um, so I started really pressing to open that door and have more conversations about it. And one of the things I remember being challenging was getting on the same page about 
how we talked about it mm -hmm. and and where our boundaries were because i wanted to honor the actual boundaries you had but i didn't want you to to continue to hide something because you because you had made you had taken somebody else's moral judgment yes. and made it yours yeah but it wasn't it, it wasn't, wasn't yours and i my suspicions were that that was not yours but that was it was years of conversations to unpack and i mean some still of it, trip over we, it sometimes we, absolutely yeah. i mean it's only a year ago that i asked you to show me something that you might be ashamed of showing me you showed me a clip that was so benign that was only a year ago wow. oh my god okay yeah. so i as a fun game i was like so i'd love it for you to show me something that you watch that you are a little like you feel like oh no oh, oh no this I, is oh edgy. no i couldn't i couldn't possibly show you that so you did edgy. you made this big deal you were like okay so this is really edgy and you looked all nervous and you shared it with me and i was it was oh like, god it's like straight out of a judd apatow movie <laughs> it was it was i i am so careful to never like laugh or i you couldn't pull you couldn't I hold could it together not i broke the fourth <laughs> wall i broke the fourth wall first off it was something we had watched together dozens of times it was not something that had never watched been seen. done it was not done um, dozens and dozens <laughs> Sometimes. not over the it was not edgy which was so. interesting because what i recognized so i i i kind of lost it and i took a risk and said i think you showed me that on purpose so that i would push you to actually explore the edge and we had this conversation it was very it was it was right at the edge of like i didn't want to coerce you but i wanted to invite you to share something that was actually edgy and I don't know whether it was true or not that, I, I mean, I, it wasn't consciously on purpose as far as I know, but there's plenty of unconscious stuff, but it doesn't even matter because your approach allowed me, gave me something I could use to change what was happening because I didn't want it to go that way. So I remember so now. So you gave me a way to do it different. Right. It? So I invited you. I said, do you want to try again? Yeah, I'm that was sorry so useful. That this didn't, like, this didn't yeah. work. And, and I didn't mean to, I mean, I did, I, I kind of, I just kind of like really seriously i was pretty dismissive like this can't possibly be it and at first you were offended you were like i i but i braved myself i volunteered i was vulnerable and i was like ah oh, were, were you, were though? you though? yeah and it was only five or six minutes of like yeah it was back and forth was where i was like quick. are are you sure though really that's as edgy as it gets for you really yeah so that... then you pulled up something that was actually edgy for yeah. you yeah and it was fascinating and different and not something i had expected and it was perfectly ethical and, and there were no safe. elephants there was no involved. there were no Just elephants but it was it was i didn't know you liked this thing mm -hmm. it was actually new information which is what you had been looking that's for that's what i was looking time. for the whole time and it was yeah so the, i mean this is that, that was that was 11 years into yeah. practicing this every day, this everyday communication. This never ends. So a year from now, we'll be recording. Yeah, what, what's your something, something more else will come up? Come yes. Up. So you use these questions about porn, about my use of it, as another window into me, finding out more about yes. me. And um, so that's... So, what, and and there's there are questions we've explicitly answered with yes, porn absolutely so porn. this was in, in so early days we were we were in a multi-person relationship we were consensually non-monogamous but we were also so i was dating people uh, not well but i was dating um you were still married to someone else we were all living together it was there was there was um complexity to our relationship yeah. but on top of that there was this um desire to pursue consensual non-monogamy we yeah. wanted to figure out like so how do you do that really mm -hmm. how do you do it well and one of the big questions that we seem to be struggling with was well how will we feel when we come face to face with our partner having sexual experiences erotic experiences with other people yep. whether that's like face to face as in face to face in the same room or whether that's 
oh, I know. Finding I mean, you're going on a date tonight. The story, yeah. And so there, it, it like it's entered my my awareness. Oh, right, you're going to be on a date tonight. Sure. So you may have sex. I don't know. And pornography was the best way. And I keep using the whole word. I keep pornography. hearing. I keep hearing in you Good keep Omens. Hearing Gabriel. Gabriel. Angel in, Gabriel. In the wonderful show, Good Omens. Humans are. We are here to buy pornography. Oh, such a good, yes. such a good show. So, okay, when anyway, <laughs> sidebar. Watch okay. Good Omens. Um, but I wanted to explore the sexual realities, the realities that were like what was going to get woken up in and me. You really like to imagine experiences before you have them. I really you do. Love, anticipation, anticipation is and, huge and, for um, me. Yeah. So. So, and I also use it as a way to keep me safe. Uh, I use yes. my imagination as a way. So, when I talk about security and feeling secure in my non monogamous relationship, one of the ways that I feel secure is that I am. I am constantly playing with really actively playing with image. I'm playing with the images in my mind of you engaging with other people and me engaging with other people and I'm I'm sorting through my feelings and my thoughts about this in a, in a safe container, in the safe container of my own imagination. I don't, not everybody does this the same way, but that's one of the ways. And porn let us do that together too. Right. So, so right you, at the beginning, we would, we would watch like, what, so what happens when you, when you're watching this woman who I can see that you're attracted to on the screen and I'm feeling like, oh, I am not like them. Uh, I can, I can self monitor. I could go inside and check like, how am I feeling? Am I feeling um, uh, insecure? Am I feeling a lack of self-worth? Am I, am I judging myself? Am I judging my body? What's going on? And the answer to all of those questions was, yes, I am. Okay. There's my homework list. That's not about you. Mm -hmm. You didn't need to change your attraction to the beings on the screen. I needed to go inside and do my inner work to get to, sh to really dig into my self-worth, to really dig into, so how, how am I coming to terms with this, this body that I have that is, it's perfect just the way it is. Even if I want to change it, it's also perfect just the way it is. It doesn't even matter. Right. I, that was such profound work and it came from putting myself in a position to watch you watching and to watch both of us watching. It, there was, it was like a, a safe way to explore. So what, what would you think if that, if I were doing that, how would that feel for you? We had conversations about and it is, I, I found it easier to imagine with, um, in the context of watching porn, right. in the context of something happening right there in front of me to imagine you into the picture and how I would feel. And I think that's where the, the image. So psyche's first language is image. Psyche doesn't think in words so mm -hmm. much as psyche presents image. So when we offer psyche image, the imagination actually opens up and now there's a presence. There's an ability to like, oh, okay, now this is, this is real in a different way. So rather than just the thought experiment of, I want to be a person who can tolerate my yep. partner doing X, Y, and Z. Now we can start to try to feel and sense and, and, emote into it think yeah. into wow okay what if they were what if they were sucking on this licking that what if they were what if they look like they are having the deepest passion i have ever seen on their face right and what then how will i feel what if i was seeing yeah so we t we used porn as a way to explore those things at, before during and after we started having experiences of with other people, um, yeah. especially exper group experiences where we were going to have the actual visuals of, of each other doing things. Um, and one of the things that it uncovered for me was that that's, that's one of the best parts. I love the, mm -hmm. I love the imagination of your, of your pleasure. I love the imagination of you watching my pleasure. I, I love that, but I needed to experience it and like stretch my, my, uh, my idea of what's acceptable to include yeah, yeah. oh you know what i like that i like it not everybody has to but i do porn isn't simple 
Mm -hmm. Our answers, our experience of this is, is ours. Um, we're going to post some uh, links to some ethical resources. Um, I think it's important, though, that we cover one last thing before we, can, we wrap up. And that is the idea of porn addiction. Now, the addiction model in general, let's just say um, I struggle with applying the word addiction to, uh, to things that are not uh, substances. <laughs> I struggle with, with applying it to something that can be physically removed from, from you and with no, no withdrawal you know, your, your body's not going to go into a, a life or death withdrawal symptom. So you withdraw from alcohol and your body can experience death from this removal. Right. You withdraw pornography and you're not going to die. Your body is not, your liver's not going to shut down. Um, so I struggle with applying that word. And there are lots of people um, in the sex education world who, who struggle with, is that word really a, an effective um, way to 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 talk about out of control sexual behavior. So I like the phrase out of control sexual behavior to a point. I what I want to introduce is the idea that rather than applying the term addiction, especially to what somebody else is doing, if if the term addiction, if if saying I have an addiction to porn or food or whatever, if that helps you make sense of your experience of, of something in your life, then that's, that's up to you. I, I'm not going to step on that. If that helps you make sense of something that you're experiencing with your partner, okay. But when we put a label like addict, like addiction that's a, on an experience that's someone else word. is having, there's a lot of moral judgment that, that ha yep. is attached to the word yeah. addiction. Um, but there's also a lot of, um, there can be a learned helplessness thing that gets attached to that. There can be this idea that the addiction is just happening to you and that you are not a, 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 an autonomous adult with, with agency and an ability to ask for help. And so the, my general statement about porn addiction is let's show really significant care about when we toss that phrase around. Um, a lot of people have a moral problem with porn and deciding that porn is addictive may actually be more about a morality issue than an, and, and control of other people's behavior and erotic life than actually trying to to connect with others yeah so is are you saying that the addiction model is applied here has um like risks associated there are with risks it yeah for... there, there are very real risks and one of those risks is that you might miss the opportunity to know your partner as they are so because oh, yeah. i just want to take it down like this isn't i'm not offering um, like a general model of how we should do this. Just you and I exist in a relationship together, no matter how many other people there are in the relationship, yes. no matter what else you do here, we are in our relationship. I have found immense, um, pleasure and growth opportunity by, by withdrawing any judgments, any big yes. judgment words from your behaviors. And instead asking you to describe to me, how are you feeling about your, so in this example, I would say, how do you feel about your porn use? Mm -hmm. How, what are your own thoughts and feelings about it? Does any of it feel like it's interfering with your enjoyment of life or sex or our connection? And there were definitely times when I would have answered that as yes, yes. I think it is interfering with my, uh, with my relationships with the people around me. So tell me about a time when you might have said that it was interfering. What was going on? Um, so I had found, um, remember that movie Men, Women, and Children? Yes. That we watched? Yeah. Which was a, an amazing movie of stories. It of, was an interesting interweaving um, and, of stories. And included in that was porn use. Um, 
It was a pretty strong story, but uh, it had and some I disagreed resonance. With part of it, but yep, it, I did had, too. But it had some resonance with my my far. experience of um, my use of porn was uh, it was starting to constrict what I found erotic mm -hmm. through habit, basically. Yeah, and um, it was. It was harder to reach orgasm. It was harder to, I don't remember it being harder to get an erection, but it might have been. Um, and there are a lot more things to sex than just those two things, but. But your your version of what was erotic was more narrow than it was, two. That's right. So you might not have. And so it, inter and it interfered with um, our early sexual relationship because I had been primarily masturbating. Yeah, so you had habituated and, your body to and, something. And I had to rehabituate. But you'd also habituated, and I think this is more important, because people ask this about um, about vibrators all the time. Like, will that, will that break my, my clit? Right. Will I, you know, will I not be able to have orgasms? The evidence is in. We know that that's not true, but you can habituate to something, and, and then just, like, you make an, an erotic zone, and, and mm -hmm. it's hard to imagine past right. that. And it's... And your body starts to just respond very easily to one set of stimuli. Yeah. I mean, that's how and then we, we know that's how the, the brain path. works. Pa right. Your neural yeah. pathways just, that are frequently used are it's a more likely to be used. So, and then yeah. and then we just get into that 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 pattern. So, for me, stretching the imagination around what may what pleasure fe is yep. what it feels and, like, and that was the good news about it was okay. So I find that the um, habituating on porn as as the my primary erotic experience interfered with you being a part of my erotic experience and the solution the good news was to just imagine different right and just we started it was all my imagination and your discussions about porn and taking the the shame away from it and and things like that made it more possible to keep that connection strong but we also just started actively sharing the viewing yes which so my experience oh, yeah, was right. you have defined in the past you've defined sex itself at, like when i've asked what is sex you've said the overlapping of erotic stories right i think one of the first ways we did that because we weren't having penetrative intercourse yep. and i we went six almost seven months before we before we were really really physically engaging beyond just sort of making out yeah. um that but but that that in that very first in that those first couple months when we were the first stories were well here i watched this and it was just like four or five minutes it wasn't like yep. here i watched this this, this I movie. did. I mean, I had whole movies. I had like whole DVD. I had a DVD yeah. collection. There were pirates. There were. There <laughs> oh, were all there kinds were of pirates. Things. Oh, old school Athena mm. porn. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the the sharing, the overlapping of those stories, was the entry point for us to then be, begin co-creating our fantasy life. So we each yes. still have a separate fantasy yep. life, but we also have one that is commingled. It is co-created. Yeah. One that. I mean, I have fantasies that I play out with you verbally um, that don't, have nothing to do really with my... Don't really involve me. <laughs> right. I, but I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I have fantasies that yeah. only involve you. Right. That, that I don't play out with anyone else yep. or even alone. Um, and and sharing porn was the one of the first ways we practiced that. And I, I, I'm grateful that my... This is one of the places where I'm super grateful that I had the parents I had. For whatever reason, they managed to not make this a big deal. And that said, it was the 80s and 90s <laughs> when I was growing up. It was a little easier. Um, if you're concerned about porn use and teenagers, that is a whole other discussion. There is a lot to be said about normalizing sexual imagery and, and normalizing the fact that our, our teens look for sexual imagery and figuring out how to have these conversations so that we don't, um, well, clamp our, eye, our our hands over our eyes yeah. and just pretend that our kids aren't going to see this stuff, nor do we incidentally, accidentally, or even intentionally shame them yeah. about seeking imagery yep. because it's completely typical 
And so they have access to stuff that isn't, um, they may not understand. So there are big conversations to have. We're going to have a whole show about talking to your kids about this for the purposes of this episode. This is just about with your partner or partners, with yourself, with consenting adults. Yeah. I don't want to circle back to the beginning about the ethically made porn. Um, I want to express my gratitude to the sex workers who make this possible. Um, They're, their their jobs their that's their that's profession work. their skill their craft yeah. their artisanry <laughs> yeah i am so grateful and i'm grateful for the way that they they fight for erotic freedom yes um that is that and is they fight against the of... shame that has plagued me i i find that personally very valuable right there are some amazing people to follow along this line. Um, I'll also put links in there. Yes. One that comes to mind is um, Stripper Writer. You yeah. can follow um, Elle Stanger's work on Instagram. Um, there are, are others, some some amazing voices out there. We'll put a few links in mm-hmm. so that you can start expanding your imagination of what it means to make ethical porn. So with all that said... Um, go yeah. watch something. Go watch something if you, when, talk if about and, it. and how you want to. And then talk about it. Okay, next time. Thank you for listening to the Project Relationship Podcast with Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And Ken Hamilton. If you're enjoying our conversation, we would be so grateful if you would drop a rating and quick review so more people will be able to find us. And if you have questions or suggestions that you of things you'd like us to tackle, please send an email to Jolie at JolieHamilton.com. I'd love to hear them. Project Relationship, the Entrepreneur's Action Plan for Passionate, Sustainable Love, is available on Amazon in Kindle, soft, or hardcover versions. This book is a succinct, practical guide to improving your love life. I wrote Project Relationship to give you a set of quick action tools and conversation guides that can transform a mediocre relationship into a fabulous one. These tools are based not just on what Jolie learned in her studies, but on what we actually do to make our relationship thrive. Until next time, remember, relationships can be messy, and that's good news.